system to send single stage reviews into low Earth orbit. Yeah, it's awesome. I can't wait to hear more about what, the, what they've been up to. And her talk is titled, Beam the Power Up, Scotty. Please join me in welcoming Leticia. Thanks for uh, your great introduction, and uh, thanks for the fun reference to Star, De Star Trek. We're going to talk today about uh, boldly going where no one has gone before. Um, and uh, for those of you who don't know uh, about Escape Dynamics, we are developing an externally powered system where energy needed for the space vehicle to reach orbit uh, is not stored on board the vehicle, uh, as is the case with chemical rockets, uh, but where that energy is wirelessly transmitted to the vehicle uh, using a microwave uh, beam. So uh, using microwave-powered uh, propulsion is really what we think is the next giant leap in space access. And so I'm very excited to be with uh, you today to talk about that. And I will structure my keynote today around three key areas. First, I will talk about why and how we can and must move beyond chemical rocket. Then I will discuss the externally powered space launch system that we are deploying. And uh, finally, I will wrap up with where we are and a company announcement uh, that I'll be making today and for which we have a press release out this morning, which I think uh, will go to show you that indeed boldly going uh, where no one has gone before. So to start off, I think when we think about space access and orbital launch, there is one image that we all think about, and it's been that same image for now over 50 years. That image is the image of a chemical rocket where 90% of the mass fraction of the vehicle is for onboard fuel. Now, chemical rockets have served us really well over the past 50 years. There has been two major challenges that have been left unaddressed by the industry. The first is the cost, which has remained prohibitive for most but uh, the most valuable uh, payloads. And the second is the lack of routine on-demand launch opportunities. Another thing to note about chemical rockets is that there is a fundamental uh, limited efficiency uh, that is uh, directly rooted in the rocket equation and which dictates that close to 90% of the mass fraction of that vehicle needs to be allocated to uh, the fuel. And so that means only 10% is left for payload and for structure, which me makes reusability extremely challenging. Another thing that is rooted uh, deeply in the rocket equation is that chemical rocket uh, will never reach specific impulse uh, above 400 second, uh, and we know this is below the threshold uh, required for a single stage to orbit spaceflight. So why do I bring this? Because we think that the future is really in reusable single stage to orbit space planes. And the reason microwave powered launch is the next giant leap in space flight is because it has a capability to produce specific impulse that is above the threshold needed for single stage to orbit operation. With reusable single stage to orbit operation, comes aircraft-like operation to space, the ability for smaller payload to fly as a primary payload, and finally, a hundred-fold decrease in the cost of access to space 
for payload up to 200 kilogram compared to what they would have paid on a chemical launcher today. And I'm saying 200 kilogram, uh, there is something magic about that number because this is where we minimize the cost of the ground infrastructure, but obviously we can scale those payloads over time to 1,000 kilogram and more. Now, let me tell you why now is the time for microwave-powered propulsion. Externally powered propulsion is not a new idea. In fact, it was first theorized uh, in the 1920s by no other than Tsiolkovsky, who brought to us the rocket equation and wrote in the spaceship in 1924 that the most efficient way to go to space will not be using chemical rockets, but will be using millimeter wave energy that is beamed to the vehicle. Now, of course, a lot of technology breakthrough had to occur before this could become a reality. And amongst those breakthrough, the development of phased array technology in the radio telescope industry, which we're actually using in reverse, the development of the gyrotron technology throughout the 70s and 80s, and in some way, and, uh, more importantly, uh, for the purpose of the timing, some other advancement that occurred as recently as this very decade. And this advancement include industrial scale energy storage battery system, advances in the particle accelerator industry around fast discharge of energy, and advances in materials around ceramic matrix composite that as you will see is a key part of uh, our vehicle, of the heat exchanger of our vehicle. I'd like to also uh, make a note to uh, Caltech and NASA Ames that have done wonderful investigative work uh, in that field uh, because uh, technological breakthrough and advances don't happen with a lot of smart brains uh, that are working on the same topic, and so uh, they should be recognized for that. But now the fun part, let me walk you through uh, what our launch system looks like. I will break down for you the ground infrastructure element and then we'll talk about the reusable space planes. So on the left here, our team has designed and patented a system uh, which is based on an energy storage system coupled uh, with a mechanism to discharge high voltage DC energy into a bank of high power microwave sources. The total energy required to launch a 200 kilogram payload to orbit is 800 megawatt over a 300 second duration, which is a duration that the spacecraft takes to reach orbit. And that's equivalent to an industrial scale battery system of about 65 megawatt hour, which you can fill over up to a 24 hour period in which case uh, the draw that you represent on the grid is a mere three megawatt. So that problem is solved. Uh, the second piece of the ground infrastructure is here the high power microwave sources also known as gyrotron. Those uh, gyrotron are today used mostly in plasma fusion and high energy physics experiment uh, there are only a couple of them that are produced a year globally and uh, thus at quite expensive uh, rates. And so one of the key areas in which uh, our team has worked is advancing this technology further and redesigning the gyrotron so we can build more affordable gyrotron. We will need uh, about uh, 800 of those gyrotron for each of the two arrays that we will have for a space launch system. So this is a key element for us to advance. The, th the third and last piece of the ground infrastructure is the phased array of antennas. Uh, so as you can tell, we're using a modular approach uh, to beaming that energy to the spacecraft. And what that modular approach uh, gives us is both a lot of redundancy in the system and the ability uh, to control 
uh, the width of the aperture uh, that we have on the ground so we can focus uh, the energy at various ranges. Uh, our team also designed, patented, a side lobe suppressing system uh, so that we could capture the nominal side lobe that you generate when you beam energy, which was also one of the major challenges that had not been solved before. And finally, moving on to the space plane and uh, the microwave absorbing heat exchanger. And for that, I will move over to a closer up view of the vehicle. And I think that the first thing I want to point out about the vehicle that hopefully strikes all of you is that it is pretty simple. It's essentially a tank, a turbo pump, a heat exchanger, and an aerospack nozzle. I mean, of course, your payload bay, but it's, it's overall very simple compared to a chemical rocket. Uh, those vehicles can be built for less than $10 million and will carry payloads of 200 kilogram to orbit. The way thrust is generated is that microwave energy is beamed onto the heat exchanger. Meanwhile, we are releasing hydrogen from the tank through the turbo pump where it's being pressurized and it then flows through the heat exchanger and is exhausted at the back of the vehicle, generating the thrust required for the vehicle to reach orbit. With the externally powered propulsion vehicle, the beauty is that you reach propellant mass fraction as low as about 70%, which means you have a full 30% to allocate to payload and structure. This is plenty in a world where chemical rockets only have 10%. That means your payload efficiency can increase to 10%, and that means a lot more to allocate your structure, thus allowing for reusability. And throughout the trajectory that we have uh, planned for the vehicle, uh, we paid close attention that the mass would be seven so that we could, of course, take satellite payloads on board. Now let's take a closer look at the arrays. We have two arrays, the takeoff array that you see here and the booster array, which is over here. Both array are about 400 megawatt of high power microwave energy. They're separated by about 200 kilometer so that the booster array takes over when the vehicle is out of the range of the takeoff array. And uh, that's about it <laughs> on the array. Uh, what I'm gonna show you now is a animation of our launch sequence which Hopefully, we'll give you a great sense of uh, what uh, our launch will look like. So the vehicle is here on the space launch, uh, vertical takeoff position. It was just fueled in hydrogen a little before takeoff. That slopey building here houses 800 high power microwave sources and antennas that are directly beaming to the heat exchanger on the belly of the vehicle. Hydrogen is being flown through and exhausted at the back and this is all of the energy that is uh, provided for the vehicle to take off. As the vehicle accelerates, once it reaches the handoff point, the booster array takes over. What you're seeing here are the side lobe suppressing system, which are water jacketed radome around the antennas. The vehicle reaches orbit. Uh, it's in orbit and release uh, the payload and open uh, the payload bay door uh, on the apogee, uh, which you'll see uh, momentarily. Once the satellite releases its payload, it uses cold gas thrusters to slow down and start its re-entry. As the vehicle re-enters in the atmosphere, 
The ceramic matrix heat exchanger also serves as the main thermal protection system for the vehicle. The vehicle lands and is ready for a quick inspection, re reloading, refueling, and ready to go again. So now I want to show you where we are uh, on the path to making this actually happen. Uh, we are three years into an eight years plan. We spend the first three years in designing, patenting uh, all key aspects of the system. Uh, we also prototyped high power microwave generation and wireless energy transfer systems. And now that we have the systems in our lab, we started uh, engine demonstration and wireless energy transfer demonstration. Following this, we will start a phase of flight and drop test. And uh, around uh, right before the end of the decade, uh, we will start building the infrastructure and at the turn of the decade, uh, send our first payload to orbit. This is some of the hardware that we have built and uh, is in use in our lab today. On the left here is a 100 kilowatt uh, gyrotron again, also known as high power microwave source that transforms the grid energy into high power microwave energy. It functions at uh, 92.3 gigahertz uh, in continuous mode. Uh, and the system that we will use for the space launch system are 500 kilowatts. So they're a scaled version of what you're seeing here on screen. Uh, this is uh, our first antenna. Uh, the antenna that we will use for the launch system will be 8 to 10 meters antenna. Uh, again, a scaled version of the antenna that you are seeing on screen. We also have a big effort ongoing uh, in the fields of material, uh, in particular around ceramic metrics. Uh, the first materials that we have tested are actually uh, silicon carbide, uh, but uh, we are continuing or effort uh, to be able to manufacture uh, silicon carbide ceramic matrix composite because our team established that uh, ceramic matrix composite would be uh, the best materials uh, for the heat exchanger uh, as far as all the flight properties uh, that, that they had combined with the microwave absorption uh, properties that uh, we can give those materials. Uh, we have been uh, pursuing a number of tests in the lab with uh, all those uh, new systems that we have. Uh, we have been pursuing both low power beaming tests and high power beaming tests. The low power beaming tests have essentially been a test uh, for tracking uh, of a UAV inside the lab using a 50 uh, milliwatt uh, power source whose beam is actually similar in shape to the one of our gyrotron, so that later on we could just substitute the gyrotron for that beam, uh, and which we plan when we take this experiment outside our lab. And uh, the other experiments that we have been uh, pursuing are uh, to beam with our uh, gyrotron onto a heat exchanger and measure the thrust the specific impulse uh, using uh, a heat exchanger and flowing through helium through that heat exchanger. Uh, we were able to show in this experiment also the ability to uh, completely shut down the beam uh, within a 200 nanosecond of uh, a, an interlock uh, trigger event uh, which is also something that uh, we pay close attention to as we do this experiment to prove all the safety uh, procedures. Uh, let me show you some of the videos of our recent demonstrations. So this is uh, a cut of the design of our gyrotron. And this is our lab in Broomfield in Colorado with some of uh, our team members working on the gyrotron. We show a very, you saw a very shortcut of a, a 16 feet uh, uh, length, long uh, enclosure that we have and that we're using uh, to do this experiment. And here you're seeing a 3D animation uh, so we can show you how 
uh, we're beaming onto the heat exchanger, uh, which is a complete system uh, of a microwave powered uh, thruster, really. Now moving on to the tracking demonstration using low power. So the power here is not used to power the UAV again. This is just for tracking purposes. Uh, we have put LEDs on the bottom of uh, that UAV you see here. And uh, when tracking works, uh, you will see the LED actually uh, flash up. And the speed at which we're tracking that UAV are in fact much higher than what will be required for our space launch system. So uh, the one thing I'm most excited though to announce today uh, and which uh, hopefully will show you that we are indeed uh, boldly going where no one has gone before, is that uh, we had successful tests uh, with this uh, full system of a microwave-powered thruster that demonstrated over 500 seconds of specific impulse, which is above the specific impulse of chemical rockets, and in hydrogen equivalent term, had we used hydrogen in the experiment instead of helium, would have been uh, uh, far beyond the level needed uh, for uh, uh, the level needed for a uh, single stage to orbit operation, which is 600 seconds. Uh, so I'm extremely excited about those results. Uh, I have a little cut here of the actual data of those results. Uh, as it came through uh, when we were running the test. Uh, so that's a run from June 11th, and as you can tell, uh, the ISP was over 500 uh, seconds, and, and we were beaming onto the heat exchanger for a total of uh, uh, a little over 12 seconds. Uh, but there are uh, many other things to look forward to. Thank you. <laughs> I think uh, the whole team in Colorado is uh, very excited by this and uh, will be uh, very thankful for, for your uh, endorsement. Uh, it will mean a lot to them. Uh, I'm sure some of them are watching right now. And uh, so we have another set of uh, future exciting demonstration in the next couple of years. And so I wanted to just give you a flavor what to look forward to. Uh, the very first one is that we're going to take this experiment we just did in our lab outside the lab. Uh, instead of using helium as a propellant flow, we're going to use hydrogen, which will give us much higher ISP. We think we will reach close to 750 seconds of ISP. Uh, we will also, and very importantly, instead of using a silicon carbide heat exchanger, this time use a ceramic matrix composite heat exchanger. Uh, and this is part of the ongoing effort uh, uh, that is happening at our lab and that we will pursue over the next couple of months. Um, following this uh, next demonstration, uh, you can look forward to uh, the first demonstration of a continuous UAV flight powered with microwave energy. And following this, we will build the orbital vehicle and start demonstrating the first flight of the vehicle with a ground power array of about 20 megawatt. Uh, and then uh, it's only about scaling the system uh, so that we can uh, reach orbit with a much bigger uh, ground array. Uh, so that's it, the future is now. Please join us in uh, helping us revolutionize space access. And uh, I will be on a panel after this keynote, but uh, I will be outside the room for any Q&A. Uh, or we may have time for two questions, actually, I'm hearing from Curtis. So I will happily take two questions. Yes? In the technology slide, one of your items was Mark's modulator. Yes. What is that? Uh, so the Marx modulator uh, is a recent innovation in the particle accelerator industry uh, adding on for uh, the system that allows us uh, to discharge high voltage DC power into the bank of high power microwaves 
And uh, this is a, a technology, an innovation, that uh, came up with a method uh, to basically discharge at very high discharge rate. Other question? Yeah. Do you think your beaming technology would be uh, a good tool in terms of space-based solar power and bringing power back to Earth? So there are a number of uh, technologies that uh, I, I think need to be evaluated in space uh, so, uh, power beaming and for uh, beaming from space to Earth. Uh, there is a very interesting work out of Caltech, uh, Harry Art Waters Group in particular. Uh, we are for now focused on uh, using the technology for orbital launch. Uh, we will explore other avenues to, uh, to use the technology and other use cases, but for now, uh, orbital launch is what we're focused on. Yeah, and so for power beaming from above, and if you're thinking power beaming from space to another uh, uh, planetary body, for example, uh, there are other technology that may be a uh, better position for that, and this is why I was uh, referring to the work uh, that Caltech is doing in that field in the group of RE Hot Water uh, as one of several other examples. So rectenna based technology uh, or other technology that are, I think, very interesting in that field. Thank you. You're welcome. Can this technology be used for human space exploration? And in particular, I'm just radiation concerns due to the uh, Method of yeah, transfer. absolutely. And this will be the last question that I will take, I was just told. Uh, but so, uh, so the, the radiation concern uh, are, have to do with uh, the, the side lobes that are created when you beam microwave and microwave that, that could uh, sort of, uh, could the pillow bay or if we had a human in, you know, uh, on the flight. So, uh, the way we're building the vehicle is to isolate all the key parts of the vehicle from microwave. And so we're able to do that. And uh, this is absolutely a technology that uh, we uh, plan over time to get uh, human rated. Uh, but we will start with uh, payloads. Thank you very much. Ouch. Is the next giant leap in space flight is because it has a capability to produce specific impulse that is above the threshold needed for single stage to orbit operation. With reusable single stage to orbit operation comes aircraft like operation to space, the ability for smaller payload to fly as a primary payload. And finally, a hundredfold decrease in the cost of access to space for payload up to 200 kilogram compared to what they would have paid on a chemical launcher today. And I'm saying 200 kilogram, uh, there is something magic about that number because this is where we minimize the cost of the ground infrastructure, but obviously we can scale those payloads over time to a thousand kilogram and more. Now, let me tell you why now is the time for my So to start off, I think when we think about space access and orbital launch, there is one image that we all think about, and it's been that same image for now over 50 years. That image is the image of a chemical rocket where 90% of the mass fraction of the vehicle is for onboard fuel. Now, chemical rockets have served us really well over the past 50 years. There has been two major challenges that have been left unaddressed by the industry. The first is the cost, which has remained prohibitive for most but uh, the most valuable uh, payloads, and the second is the lack of routine on-demand launch opportunities. Another thing to note about chemical rockets is that there is a fundamental uh, limited efficiency uh, that is 
directly rooted in the rocket equation and which dictates that close to 90% of the mass fraction of that vehicle needs to be allocated to uh, the fuel. And so that means only 10% is left for payload and for structure, which me makes reusability extremely challenging. Another thing that is rooted uh, deeply in the rocket equation is that chemical rocket uh, will never reach specific impulse uh, above 400 second, uh, and we know this is below the threshold uh, required for a single stage to orbit spaceflight. So why do I bring this? Because we think that the future is really in reusable single stage to orbit space planes. And the reason microwave powered lab system to send single stage into low Earth orbit. Yeah, it's awesome. I can't wait to hear more about what, they, what they've been up to. And her talk is titled, Beam the Power Up, Scotty. Please join me in welcoming Leticia. Thanks for uh, your great introduction, and uh, thanks for the fun reference to Star, De Star Trek. We're going to talk today about uh, boldly going where no one has gone before. Um, and uh, for those of you who don't know uh, about Escape Dynamics, we are developing an externally powered system where energy needed for the space vehicle to reach orbit uh, is not stored on board the vehicle, uh, as is the case with chemical rockets, uh, but where that energy is wirelessly transmitted to the vehicle uh, using a microwave uh, beam. So uh, using microwave-powered uh, propulsion is really what we think is the next giant leap in space access. And so I'm very excited to be with uh, you today to talk about that. And I will structure my keynote today around three key areas. First, I will talk about why and how we can and must move beyond chemical rocket. Then I will discuss the externally powered space launch system that we are deploying. And uh, finally, I will wrap up with where we are and a company announcement uh, that I'll be making today and for which we have a press release out this morning, which I think uh, will go to show you that indeed boldly going uh, where no one has gone before. 